So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on how to ace GMAT RC. My name is Raja Sadana, one of the co-founders of eGMAT, and I'm going to be your main host today. Um, supporting me in this webinar, we have Harsha. Harsha is, uh, is, is uh, a subject matter expert at eGMAT, and, uh, and, and, and he's going to be my co-host. Also, we have Sandeep, who's a GMAT strategy expert, and he is also going to be my co-host today. Um, the topic of this webinar is, is um, you know, achieve 90, 90th percentile in, in GMAT reading comprehension. In this webinar, we talk about a few key reading strategies um, uh, that, that, that uh, you can use to get to that 90th percentile. We're going to introduce those strategies. We're going to then demonstrate how to use these strategies. And then we're going to apply these strategies on a couple of small passages and then one full length passage. Um, overall, a fairly application-oriented session, uh, uh, and, 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 and so we do require that you have some basic idea of bar, uh, how to go to the, get to the main point of a uh, reading comprehension passage. We do require that, that you should have some sort of an idea about what an inference is, what, how to extract details. Uh, if you have not gone through, if you don't have th that clarity, we do provide a number of video lessons as a part of our free trial. A couple of them are mentioned here on the left-hand side. You can um, uh, you can get to those uh, over there. Now we also have some upcoming free sessions. We have a, a, a free se a free quant workshop that is tomorrow. Uh, it's designed for folks who are um, in that uh, uh, Q35 to Q47, Q48 range, and it's designed to help you get to that next five to next six points on on GMAT quant. Think of this workshop as, as a proctored mock test where you know you, we not, not only evaluate where you currently stand and give you an estimate of, of what your likely score is going to be, but we also tell you what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, which subsection are you weak in, and beyond that, we also tell you what habits uh, enable you to or ca are causing um, you know your score, which means that, hey, are you not extracting enough information out of the question? Are you not considering all cases? Um, are you are you not formulating a plan to attack a question? And, and, and based on your responses, uh, we have those questions intelligently tagged that allow us to 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 draw those um, to derive those insights. Then next weekend, which is exactly a week from now, we have a free critical reasoning webinar in which we talk about pre-thinking, um, uh, uh, and, and and we focus just on assumption questions. In this, we we, we teach what pre-thinking is. We then demonstrate how you can use pre-thinking to answer the easiest or the most challenging uh, uh, critical reasoning questions. Pre-thinking is a method. Um, it's been there for a very long time, but but we were the first company to define it and to create, formulate a, a, a proper method to, to solve questions using pre-thinking. Again, that's next week, and click on that register now button to register for the same. Uh, with that, I have about 150 students in this webinar. Let's kind of get to know you guys a bit better. I want to know. Um, when do you plan to take the GMAT? I also want to know what is 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 your target GMAT score. Let's let's get that response over here. What is your target GMAT score over here? All right, based on the data that I have right over uh, in. Uh, in the polls, what you can see is um, a good chunk of you, about 30% of you are aiming to have more than a, uh, more than 60 days before your GMAT. We have a few of you who have between, um, uh, who have your GMAT right away. That's about 17% or about 29 of you. Then uh, slightly more than that have between 15 and 30 days before your GMAT. And and, and, and about 60% of this class has, um, of this group has more than a month before you take the GMAT, which means if you have more than a month, you, you know, you can improve your GMAT score by about 100 points or so, or at least 100 points. With regards to your target GMAT score, we have uh, about half of you, 50% of you are aiming for that score at 730 or higher. Um, another 30% in the 710, 720 bracket, another 13% in the 660 to 700 bracket, and then we have about 3% of this group in the 600 to 650 bracket over here. Thank you. With that, let's go right into the webinar pane. Um, as, as I go into the webinar pane, you should be seeing a, a presentation that says reading comprehension. Let me put in a yes, no poll over here. Uh, if you see this presentation that says reading comprehension, select yes. Um, 
otherwise uh, you're selecting no, 95 percent of you seeing this if you if you if, if it's still not visible at your end by this point i just recommend join again once you join again you know you reset the connection and the problem does sort out by itself thank you very much um by the way below this presentation pod you should uh, there's what we call as a q a pod or question and answer pod if at any time during this webinar you have a question you can post that question in the q a pod one thing, given my past experience, um, what I really see is a lot of people post questions for around, which are a lot more personal in nature. I would recommend to hold those questions towards the the end of the webinar. That way, uh, uh, you know, we can get exact details from you and give you good, precise answers. At the same time, if you have questions pertaining to anything that we're talking about in the webinar, feel free to ask those questions and be happy to to answer those questions right then and there. Okay. Um, again, I asked this question, uh, what kind of uh, score should you aim for? And, and about half the class um, is aiming for that question of 730 or higher. And I'll just give, spend about five minutes talking about why should you aim for that score of 730 or higher? Um, and in and, and, and today's day and age, why should you not settle for that score of 730, uh, a score less than 730? Now, there are three reasons why you should do this. First of all, um, you know, top B schools today require that score of 730 or higher. How many of you over here are aiming for a top 25 business school? Let's just get a yes, no poll over here. Let me just clear all prior answers. So how many of you are aiming for that top 25 school, regardless of whether it's in Europe, in, in India, or, or in the US? Okay. If you're aiming for that top 30, top 25 schools, they now require that score. Um, uh, the other thing is, if you're aiming for scholarships, you know, and B schools do provide upwards of um, seven, uh, about $350 million worth of scholarships, a good chunk of that scholarship money goes to people who get to that score. And then the third reason, probably the most ignored reason, is the difference in total earnings uh, between um, uh, students who, among students who graduate from a top school versus those who graduate from a tier two school. That's the highest it has ever been. It's close to half a million dollars today. So let's talk about some of these reasons over here. So um, here's some data over here which talks about median scores at top B schools. And what you see is, is we are comparing scores, uh, uh, how scores have trended from 2014 to 2018. Now, two things over here that you don't see is one is you don't see Harvard and Stanford. Why? Because even in 2014, scores over there in the, at Harvard and Stanford were at that 730 mark. The second thing is there are certain schools um, such as such as Sloan and and Columbia, where upwards of eighty percent of the class is uh, has a score of seven hundred or higher. Um, now, this is despite the fact that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, there's a fifteen percent reduction in test taking population from twenty fourteen to twenty eighteen. Now, twenty twenty is the first time when we expect to see more people taking the GMAT than has been the case um, you know in the prior year so we do expect the trend to stay or at least those those median scores around the 730 mark to stay over there um, and again this is something which if you're not aiming for that top top those top 30 schools the same trend is there uh, in school for schools rank you know 31 or higher and you can see uh, the trend over here uh, these 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 dots over here are sc are schools where that have seen the maximum score improvement or increase uh, over the last five years okay um, now, how important is the GMAT score? Here's some anecdotal data from a few students. Uh, one of our former students, Nishan, scored 690. He was rejected by, by Tuck, uh, Penn State, and Broad. And, and a nice thing about applying to Tuck, a school that I re uh, you know, really recommend that you apply to, is even when they reject you, they give you feedback. They, they, they really take a lot of pains uh, working with each and every student, whether, whether each and every prospect, whether it's a student or, 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 or whether it's someone who they reject. And they told Nishan that, hey, we like your candidacy, your GMAT score isn't enough. Then he improved to a 740 and um, was able to get into Columbia uh, and, a, and was able to get a full ride from Ohio officially. He was also able to get some scholarship money from Columbia. Pravi, very similar story applied to the score of 680 to a bunch of schools, didn't get a single interview invite, didn't apply again, just updated that score to 740. So she worked hard, improved her score to 740, and within seven hours of, of, of updating that score, she she got five interview invites. Um, she got a total of $180,000 worth of scholarships uh, as a result. 
is another example, and this is a very interesting example. KK Krishnakant, as we call him, scored 680, applied in round two, was rejected by every school um, in round two, improved his GMAT score to 720, applied in round three, which is the worst round to apply in, got four full fellowships, uh, and he's currently studying with a full ride at, at Georgia Tech Scheller. Uh, bottom line is your GMAT score today is a lot more important than it has ever been. Um, it allows business schools to differentiate, um, and, 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 and hence they, they actually, in many ways, are buying that GMAT score from you. The second reason, in addition to admission, which I think is a big enough reason, but the second reason why you should aim for that high GMAT score is, is scholarships. U.S. B schools give out about $350 million worth of scholarships. European B schools give out about $50 million worth of scholarships. And... Uh, and, 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 and more than half of that scholarship money goes to the, about 3% to 4% of students who get to that score of 730 or higher. Again, Harris, um, so, and this is the reason why we say that is because at EGMAT, we deal with about 10,000 paying students every year. Our students get about 40 to $45 million worth of scholarships every year. And, and, and so we can draw these statistical inferences where, uh, but based on our estimates, but 55% of this, uh, Scholarship money goes to people who who score 740 or higher, and 80% of the scholarship money goes to folks who get to that score of 710 or higher. Which means, if you do the math, uh, 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 what this means is that the estimated average scholarship amount, if you get to score of 740 or higher and apply properly, you should get about $40,000 of annual scholarship. Again, here is some some anecdotal data. So that was statistical data, by the way. This is what we call as anecdotal data. Mansi, one of our former students, um, uh, scored a 770, got into Harvard, Stanford, Wharton. I think she got into NCR as well as Kellogg. Um, uh, again, she got about ninety thousand uh, dollars a scholarship from uh, 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 from Harvard. That's where uh, she's studying. Victor scored 770, got a full ride from Keenan Flagler and Ross. Um, these these icons are the YouTube interviews which you can watch. Um, Post this 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 webinar. Kong Bui scored a 760, got six full fellowships. Um, uh, he started at Ohio Fisher, and 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 he not only got a from Ohio Fisher, he not only got a full ride, but he was the school paid him seventeen hundred dollars a month to study over there. I mean, we we worry about our our, our uh, tuition fees. This guy got paid to to get there. Again, these three we've already talked about the, uh, them. You can see the the scholarship amounts that they had. Um, then we have uh, uh, this one guy, uh, Ayush, who scored a 710, applied to a bunch of schools. He got interviewed by Ross uh, and, and Columbia, um, and both these schools waitlisted him. And, 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 and so he reached out to these schools and said, I thought we really connected uh, during the interview. So what happened? Why is it that you guys wait waitlisted me? Uh, so... Um, so the schools tell him, we like your candidacy, but your GMAT score isn't high enough. So he took the GMAT again, um, didn't even apply again. He just updated that GMAT score. And, and, and as soon as he did that, his, uh, his wait list was converted into an admit with scholarship. He got about $90,000 worth of scholarship from, uh, from, from Columbia. And and you can get to our YouTube channel to watch you know many of the success stories we have but a uh, hundred and ten success stories on um, uh, and these are unedited success stories on our YouTube channel overall. Um, and again, here's a quote by John Fuller who says, "Hey, someone with a 770 is way more likely to get a scholarship because uh, hey, the school's buying that score." Uh, the third reason, probably the most ignored reason, why why. Um, uh, 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 well, you should get to a top school is, is because employers value an education from a top school a lot more today than they did 10 years ago. And to do to illustrate my point, I'm going to compare two schools, Babson and MIT. And the reason I'm comparing Babson and MIT is that both these schools are in the New England area and the Boston area. And, and graduates from these schools, um, um, you know, about 60% of the graduates from both these schools find employment within the New England area. So they kind of have access to a similar set of employment opportunities, arguably. But when you look at their starting salaries, the starting salaries at Babson and, and MIT, they're off by about $40,000. Now, this delta uh, in 26, 2006, so about 14 years ago, was about $20,000. So this delta has increased. Also, when you look at their average sign-on bonus, that's off by about twenty grand. So their first year compensation the num is is off by about sixty thousand dollars today 
Now this delta was about 25 grand in 2006. So over the years, Babson has stayed where where it was in 2006. MIT the graduates from MIT have been are, are appreciated a lot more. They're, they're valued a lot more. Um, if you consider this delta to be forty-five thousand dollars per year, why? Because you don't get a bonus every year, then and you multiply it with ten, you get a delta of about four hundred and fifty k. And these are just two schools that are located twenty miles away. Again, three reasons so so that you should get to that higher score. Um, so bottom line is, if you want to get to that higher score, uh, uh, then 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 make sure that uh, that you, you continue with that. Don't settle for that score of 700 because because your brain will tell you when you study, study, and study um, uh, 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 that that hey, 700 is enough. You know because once you get to that 700, getting to that 730 becomes a ton more challenging overall. And to get to that high score, you need a, a good study plan. And and for those of you who were who did not get the opportunity to to get to to reserve a spot with one of our mentors, you guys can can do that over here. So um, you work with one of our mentors. It's it's a service that we provide. Uh, they provide you individualized milestones. They tell you precise estimates as to how much time you need in um, in each subsection, and they give you metrics that allow you to track your improvement. Is there a yeah, I say, is there a big difference in terms of um, uh, scholarship admissions at, at these schools? Uh, uh, 730 versus 750, yes. I mean, you know, so when you get to 750, you're among the top two percentile of students. When you get to 730, you are in the top four, four and a half percentile of students. So, so I mean, yes, uh, you reduce the competition significantly. So, um, I mean, I always really say if you think you can get to a 750, 760, an additional attempt is always worth it. Okay, with that, let's get to GMAT RC uh, because you should be aiming for that 90th percentile ability in GMAT RC if you want to get to that score of 730. Okay, now with that, tell me about how you approach GMAT RC. Uh, uh, tell me, how do you approach GMAT RC today? Type in your answers. And, and press enter, and once I get about 25 answers, I'd be happy to, sh to broadcast the results. How do you approach GMAT RC today? Okay. All right, I have a good number of answers. Let me broadcast results. Okay, guys, put your answers in the short answer pod, not in the Q&A pod. That way everyone can read those answers. Um, if you have a question, put that in the Q&A pod, and I, I truly appreciate that. Okay. Let's look at the kind of answers. Understand the main concept, read the full passage while writing summary, detailed approach on the initial part, and later on on the higher level view. Okay, I read and understand the task by, by understanding hard words. Just read everything. Improving vocabs, which I think is, is not so much about GMAT RC for, for, for GRE RC maybe, but not so much about GR for, but, but, but GMAT RC. Um, some people go hard and fast. Uh, some people skim through the passage. Uh, so again, what you really see is, is there are a variety of approaches uh, uh, that 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 you have between between GMA, uh, between among students over here. But two twenty six students in, that I have over here, and, and 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 so some people skim. Some people focus on vocab. Some people uh, uh, make detailed notes. Others read the passage properly but don't focus on making detail notes overall. Now, here is another question that I want to ask you. Um, what is the level of understanding you believe you have when you read an RC passage? And and, and you'd see uh, the options over here. Uh, what's the level of understanding you have when you read an RC passage? And, and this is something which is what I call a self-evaluation, where you say, okay, 
I believe based on my approach, even before, this is before you look at the first question in the passage. Uh, what is that level of understanding that you have? Okay, let me broadcast results over here. And, and thank you for, for, for that response rate. It's about 100 plus responses that I see over here. And 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 the, you can correlate the response to the prior question with the response to this question, about 47% or a close to 50% uh, have said 75% or higher. You look at the top two choices, and half the, the class is in that uh, 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 up to 75% and 50 to 75% is about half the class over there there itself. Um, now, this is something which is a self-evaluation and, 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 and so what I want to really do is I want to uh, uh, talk about, um, I want to, I, I will ask you this question once uh, in the middle of this webinar to really say where I'm going to ask you when you answered this question early on versus when you're looking at this response now based on what you've learned in the webinar, how much did you do you think you understood about the passage? Okay, um, let's not talk about this. Let's talk about how will we ace um, uh, 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 GMAT reading comprehension. I'm going to talk about three points over here. So the first thing that we're going to help you do is to to extract the most information out of the passage. So a lot of people, and about half the class over here, you believe that you're, you're spending a ton of time reading the passage, and you do spend a lot of time reading the passage, but you're still uh, reading the passage with regards to how you read a different piece of, uh, a regular piece of text. When you read GMAT reading comprehension, it has to be read from what we call as an author's intent perspective. Um, you have to, when you read a certain sentence, you need to be able to extract Every piece, every piece of information out of it. When you read a modifier, um, you should be able to really see which entity is it modifying. When you see a comparison, you should be able to map that comparison to what the author is talking about, draw inferences from it. When you see a long list, most of the time long lists are details which you can skim through. You should kind of skim through that part quickly. But but essentially, you 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 re, you need to get to read the passage from, from an author's purpose or an author's intent as to really say, understand why the author wrote each sentence and how does it lead to the, how does it add to the big picture that the author wants to communicate? Um, okay. And, and we're going to uh, talk about these reading strategies that will help us read the passage through the author's intent and we'll demonstrate these reading strategies through a couple of small passages. Then, what we are going to do is we're going to uh, uh, use that information. Once we have collected the information in this step over here, we're going to then use it in this, this step to answer questions. So once you've extracted all that information, we will showcase how that can help you reject the incorrect answer choices right away and focus all your energy on the correct answer choice. And then once we build a, a core foundation, which is going to be in about 30, 35 minutes or so, Using that core foundation, we are then going to attack a full-length official RC passage, a 700-level RC passage. And, and, and the goal over here is going to be that as you apply those strategies to that 700-level RC passage, you end up doing a lot better. You reach that next level of understanding. You really see that you truly understand the passage um, overall. Okay. Um, now... I'm going to talk about all of these strategies, uh, but but you know those strategies will not work if you don't have the right attitude. A lot of people, and uh, and, and I'm going to bring in my short answer poll question over here. They really, when the the moment they see an RC passage, the attitude that they have is to really say, okay, let me read this passage and get done with these questions, and beyond that, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to worry about this passage. How many of you have this attitude where you say, man, GMAT RC is such a burden? Let's me read the passage quickly. Let's get done with that question and then move on. How many of you have that attitude? Yes or no? A lot of you have that. I mean, we find GMAT RC boring. You try to get it done. And, and, and while with that attitude, you might be able to do easy questions, um, you know, when it comes to hard questions, you're not going to be able to do that. So the first thing you have to do is, is to change that attitude to really say, I am when you read when you see a GMAT RC passage, you're gonna uh, change that attitude to say, I'm now going to get immersed in that passage. I love GMAT RC. Even if you hate it today, just tell yourself you love GMAT RC till you're done with the GMAT. By the way, 
if you do well on the GMAT, you will never hit GMAT RC because it gives you a skill that that gives you a strategic advantage in in not just in, in on the GMAT, but also when you do case studies in business schools, when you argue with your colleagues. So so it's a, it's not a skill that you learn not just for a test, but but it's a skill for life. That's something that you that you will understand once you do this. So tell yourself from this point all onwards, I'm going to really get immersed in the passage. The topic of the passage, whether it's about women emancipation, whether it's about um, about the atrocities on on slaves, whether it's about uh, uh, space exploration, uh, you know, regardless of what your personal uh, 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 inclinations are, you're going to say, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to stay interested in, in what the topic is going to talk about. That attitude is really important. Because once you, without that attitude, you won't be able to do the second piece over here, which again is absolutely paramount uh, to ASG MRRC, which is when you read the passage, read each sentence and visualize, which means if you were the author, you really say, okay, what's the picture that I'm painting as an author? If you're and, and if you're someone who's a critical reader, you say, what is the picture that the author is painting? So you've got to understand that author's intent over there. That's the first piece. That, that you need. That attitude is really important. Without this, anything and everything that I or anyone else would teach you would 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 not yield to benefits that you're seeking. Okay. The second thing that you need to do, and is is you know, once you have the right attitude, then we get to tools. And then tools start with reading strategies. Uh, when you read a sentence, understand the sentence structure aspect of it understand how the author has written the sentence and i talked about this earlier map the modifiers to the entities they're modifying understand the kind of modification that, that they're doing focus on keywords um, predict your thoughts through keywords in in when it comes to gmat or c and in general in in cr as well um, there are keywords that the author uses to change direction. There are keywords that the author uses to present examples. There are keywords that the author uses to add to the point that he has been making. And, 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 and there are keywords where the author uses that the author uses to, to, to draw conclusions. Understand those keywords and, and in using those keywords, you can predict what the author is going to say. Don't get overwhelmed. Um, on the on GMAT RC, there's a plethora of information, and and when we put a lot of information on our brains, we can get overwhelmed. Um, don't let that happen to you. Each one of us has a, a lot of people ask this question: Should I make notes? How much notes should I make? And the answer to that is, it depends on who you are. There's some people who can absorb a lot of information who've been reading a lot for for quite some time, and and they can. Uh, they have what I call as as as, as a really long cachet or a, a huge cachet to to absorb before they need to write something. Others don't, and and it doesn't matter who you are today. What matters is that you inculcate good habits. What matters is that you, if you don't have that capacity, you work towards building that capacity, and the way you work towards building that capacity is is to really not get overwhelmed. And and as you see that your brain's starting to get overwhelmed. Take a pause, make a, a few notes, you know, um, take that piece of information, take that burden of information out from your mind into a few notes uh, and then read the next step. And as you do this again and again and again, what you're going to find is you're going to increase that mental capacity. The need to make notes will go down. And 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 I have seen um, people who are diligent that need to make notes goes down from writing down five lines to writing down two lines in about seven passages to and, and and down to writing down you know about seven to eight words for the entire passage in about 12 to 15 passages but those people are diligent they spend 30 minutes on a passage not just reading but answering questions as well on the other hand there are people who do a hundred passages and, and still aren't able to comprehend them why because they don't spend that uh, that initial time early on Okay, so Sue says, how much time should we spend on spend on reading the entire RC? Sue, as I mentioned right now, it depends on who you are. If you're someone who's who's really good at reading, who can uh, absorb a lot of information, you probably should spend about two and a half to three minutes. But if you're someone who's just starting reading, you'll probably end up spending about six minutes early on, but will reduce that time to three and a half minutes if you follow this approach. The big thing that I would really want you to take away is to do this slowly. 
you know, apply these strategies slowly. Don't rush through it. A lot of people think GMATs are test of speed. No, it isn't. GMATs are test of, um, of, 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 of a methodical approach to, to solving questions. If you have that methodical approach, you're going to do really well on the GMAT. Okay. So with that, let's kind of get to it right away. And uh, I'm going to give you about a minute to read a passage. Here is a passage. I'm going to mute myself for that minute and then I'm going to share uh, a passage. Select yes once you are done reading the passage. All right, about 90% of you are done. Um, I'm going to now share a poll question with you. And the way I do this is I, I don't want to time you guys. So I ask you to, to select this option called still solving. I want about 80 people to select still solving. And when 80 of you choose another answer choice, I call time that way. I, I, I don't feel the need to time myself to time you guys so about 60 people have said still solving i need 80 people to select still solving before i show the poll question 78 80 cool thank you very much and here is the question this is a primary purpose question All right, about 80% of the class is done. Let's get those answers in there. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. I'm going to broadcast the results. Here's how you can see how you guys did over here. Um, choice D, but which is the most popular choice, but 58 if you chose choice D. Choices B and C were very popular. Uh, choice A wasn't as popular. So let's kind of analyze this session over here. So um, the author says, bordering on one extreme, uh, one definition of ethnocentrism, EC. So whenever you see, one of the first strategies that you do is whenever you see you know, a long word, always shorten it. There's no brownie points on reading a long word. So just say EC over here. Uh, one definition of EC considers it a schismatic in-group, out-group differentiation. So I'm going to pause over here. So if you were to really summarize as to what the author is, is uh, uh, what we have read at this point, uh, what, how would you summarize this part over here? If you were to summarize from bordering on, on the extreme to, to, to in-group, out-group definition, Okay. Let's just see. Basis of difference. Let's kind of look at how. And when you look at this, this is where when you say you're reading the passage, uh, uh, how different people read the passage differently. There's a group of people who have really said there's a definition of EC. And, 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 okay, 
and, 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 and that's one group over here. And there's a second group of people who basically are really saying there's a, uh, uh, there's a view on EC. Okay, now let's just talk about this. Does the author present his his opinion on EC so far in the first part? Yes, no. Bordering on extreme one definition of EC considers it A, B, and C. Does the author present his view? No. The author, let's kind of do this, and 90% of you are saying no. You guys are absolutely correct. The author doesn't present his view on EC. He, what he's presenting He's presenting one definition of EC, saying bordering on that extreme, one definition of EC considers it some sort of a differentiation. So in this first line, and this is really important, and you might think that, hey, this is trivial, but it's really important. What the author is doing is he's presenting information to you. This is not his definition. This is not author's definition. This is someone's definition. So this is not author's. This is not author's definition, this is someone's definition, and the author is saying, bordering on the extremes, which means this is an extreme definition. The author is providing an opinion on this definition, saying one definition of EC considers as some, a schismatic in-group, out-group differentiation, and, and, and what kind of differentiation? In which internal cohesion, relative peace, solidarity, uh, and devotion to the in-group are correlated with a steady state of hostility towards the out-groups. So there are two things that are considered to be related to one another. Uh, what are those two things? You know, a bunch of these things, relative peace, solidarity, and devotions over here are correlated, which means there's a relationship between them with a steady state of, with a state of hostility towards outgroup. And what are outgroups? Uh, what else are outgroups considered? They're perceived as subhumans or an incorporation of evil. Okay. So the author presents one definition and it's not his definition he says it's someone's definition and one definition of ec considers this to be, it to be this and the author says by the way this is an exaggerated definition why does why do we know that because the author uses this 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 phrase bordering on on the extreme below before this so in this case when you think about it the author is the author is presenting one definition of ec and he's saying it's an extreme definition is that clear to all of you is that clear yes no you can type that in okay and it's really important and that's when I really say read it from an author's standpoint a lot of you were saying the author is defining easy no the author is not defining easy over here the author is just presenting an information the author is not saying that this definition is accurate the author is not saying that it's my definition he's saying one definition of easy does that Okay, so so as just to summarize, the author presents one definition of EC indicates that the definition is a bit exaggerated, and as per that definition, not as per the author, but as per that definition, these two th things happen together: love for your own people and hatred for outside uh, or, 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 or people who are considered an incorporation of evil. So uh, happens together; these things are correlated. Okay, simple passage, but but again deep passage overall okay so at a very high level the author gives us uh, or presents a definition the uh, uh, there's an inference to be drawn why that that inference is that this is not probably uh, the most precise definition it's an extreme definition and we summarize the information over here so with that let's just look at your poll responses i'm going to bring that poll back again And this is how you guys polled. Choice says to criticize a concept that encourages hostility towards people not belonging to, to the same group. Uh, the author doesn't criticize anything. The author doesn't say EC is, EC is, is, is bad. And then in this definition, uh, the, the author doesn't present, uh, does, uh, the author doesn't say that, hey, EC encourages hostility towards towards the out group. So, so uh, the author doesn't say any of that. Okay, so hence, for these reasons, uh, uh, choice A is wrong. 
ओके चॉइस बी ट्वेंटी फोर परसेंट रैली ऑफ यू ऑफ यू से चोज चॉइस बी विच इज रॉन्ग एज वेल चॉइस बी सेज टू इवेलुएट द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ ई सी वाइल इन लिस्टिंग इट्स वेरियस फीचर्स ओके ना इवेलुएशन मीन्स दैट यू 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 टॉक अबाउट प्रोज एंड कॉन्स ऑफ समथिंग डज द ऑथर टॉक अबाउट प्रोज एंड कॉन्स ऑफ ई सी इन दिस does the author talks about where is ec good where is ec bad no he doesn't talk about that so the author doesn't evaluate the concept of ethnocentrism or ec and the author does talk about a few features but not a comprehensive set of features um okay and that's just he's just presenting one definition of ec yes he's presenting one definition but remember this if if i tell you uh 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 so uh, tarang says but he does mention at 16 that's a good point tarang let's talk about a camera just to really draw parallel insight over here if i give you an extreme view of a camera and um, let's talk about an iphone camera and i say an extreme view of an iphone camera is that it is better than a professional movie camera now does it mean that i'm presenting various features of an iphone camera no right so if i tell you an extreme view of the iphone camera is that it's better than a, the best movie camera out there then will this part be correct that i'm presenting various features no it won't be correct does that help tarang good question by the way let's look at choice c choice c was also very popular but 25% of you i think chose choice c let me just bring in my poll question back uh yeah 27% chose choice c it says to define the concept of ec which leads to hierarchy amongst social groups now the author doesn't define the concept the author presents an information okay and and the difference between defining the concept versus versus presenting information is if the author wanted to define a concept okay let me just bring in my notes part over here if the author wanted to 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 define a concept what he would really say is ec is defined as or ec is x blah 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 he would not say he would not say okay he would not say one definition of this thing a bordering on one extreme one definition of something okay and that's really really important over here uh the and 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 and, and i want to make sure that you guys understand when the author says something when the, while the uh, or and uh, understand the difference between when the author says something and when the author is merely presenting information Okay. So, author presents a definition. It is not his definition. He does not define it himself, and then he doesn't really say that it leads to a hierarchy uh, among 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 social groups, right? It, what it says is there are, uh, one definition considers it to be this thing uh, in which these two things happen together. They are correlated. It doesn't mean they cause one another. Leads to means causality. Correlation is not the same as causality. and that's a really important thing for those of you who chose choice c you also said you also kind of inferred correlation to be the same as causality those are two very very different things okay choice d which is our correct answer says to introduce the concept of ec yes the author does introduce he gives us one definition and he presents a view on that definition over there uh, uh, which is that that is an extreme definition overall so he presents the view on that introduction over here that's an extreme that's an extreme way to look at ec okay which is our correct answer now for those of you who are confused between correlation and causality here is a, a chart for you to really say why correlation and causality are things uh, 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 that that are that are really important uh, to understand actually coincidence correlation causality three things really important to understand from from uh, gmat cr 
GMAT RC and to a certain degree GMAT SC as well. If you actually come to one of our SC webinars, you're going to really see how we, how the GMAT introduces causality and changes it and the answer choices to, to make meaning based errors. Now, what coincidence means is that two things are required to happen together. They may have a or may not have a direct connection. So this is kind of uh, not required causality. One may not cause the other. So this is not required. When two things are correlated, what it means is that they're connected over here. There should be a direct connection between them. Uh, one may not cause the other. They may not happen together. So that's something which is not required. When two things are causal, which means one thing leads, us, leads to another, then of course there needs to be a direct connection and then one thing should lead to another. Causality and correlation are two of the most strict concepts on, on GMAT verbal. All right. Are you guys, was that useful? Did it give you some insights? Are you guys ready for that next question where you're going to apply this knowledge? Okay. Very, very simple things. Very, very, uh, we're going to take incremental steps and we're going to apply this knowledge on another very simple question. And yeah, I like that attitude. Let's go, baby. Over here. All right. Uh, with that, let me bring in the next passage as well. I'm going to bring in my yes, no question over here so that you can put in yes or no when once you've read the passage, we clear all answers. Again, another short passage over here. Here is the passage. And I'm going to mute myself so you can read this. And again, read this slowly this time. Make notes. Sorry about that. That poll wasn't open. Get those answers in. I think most of you are done right now. Let's get to question two. Let me clear all the prior answers. And I want you to select still solving. Well, actually, we don't have a still solving for this one. So I'm going to remove broadcast results. And I'm going to give you a good two minutes to solve this question. All right, last 30 seconds, get those answers in, or last 15 seconds, actually. 
let's get to get those answers three two and one let me end the poll and broadcast the results so you can really see how the, the, the group polled as a whole choice a was really popular choice b is is very popular the most popular choice um choice c wasn't as popular choice d was quite popular but 17 of you chose choice d and choice e was also really popular about 28 percent of the the group of the class choosing choice e now here's something that i would like to to mention over here guys that if you are in this session i have about 218 people here here if you're in this session i would recommend that you um, uh, that you participate because that's the best way to to get the most feedback on on on, on this okay. so let's talk about this inference when we talk about inference in a passage and say what can be inferred whose view are we talking about over here when we talk about inference when we talk author's view inference always comes from 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 the author's view okay so let's now talk about this over here it's not your view it's the author's view always the author's views so that's the first piece that that you you look at this over here so if the author says the color blue is considered to have a soothing effect on moods of people what can you infer um, you know for those of you who really say some people say the color blue is soothing you guys are correct you can say some people really say a color blue or soothing why because the author is saying that the color blue is considered to be but if you said the color blue is soothing then you would be wrong why because the author is not telling you that the color blue is soothing the author is saying is the color blue is considered to have a soothing effect considered is the same as the word deemed over here is that piece clear if i give you the if that is that clear can you say yes or no okay and that's really important over there okay. now let's look at this EC and its canonical variants are deemed to be considered to be intimately connected with XP. So, which means that some people considered EC and 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 XP to be so xenophobia. I'm considering them as XP, considering it as XP over here. Um, so, what is so EC and its canonical variants are considered to be intimately con connected with, uh, with with XP. Which means what the author is saying is some people consider them to be intimate, intimately connected. Now let's just pause over here and a lot of piece time what you're going to understand is where you pause, how you pause determines how well you understand the passage. Then the author really defines what XP is, a complex attitude comes sentiment structure involving aversion, dislike and antagonism vis-a-vis -vis the stranger and alien and everything that the stranger and alien represents. When you look at stuff over here, here. And here, this is something that the author is defining. He's saying XP is, what is XP? XP is a complex attitude come sentiment structure that involves X, Y, and Z. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So the first part is not by the author. The author is simply presenting the information. The second part is by the author. Is, is that distinction clear? The first part's not by the author. That's why I've written the word not over there. The second part is by the author. Then the author really says, and if it's no, then you can write the question in the Q&A pod over here. Why is the second part by the author? Okay, let me just take a parallel example to, to explain this. Uh, let's just go over here. Google is considered a, a good buy Google and internet company is considered a good buy okay now in this case 
what are you as an author telling telling someone you're saying hey some people consider google to be a good buy the second thing you're telling is google google is an internet company right this part is the only thing which is which is your the inf which is your view the first part google is considered a good buy that's not your view you're just merely passing on that information is that distinction clear yes or no yeah why is that not clear okay so when i look at this over here and I see, and I'm going to remove uh, remove the the annotations from here. And this is really important. EC and its canonical variants are deemed to be connected with XP. What is XP? A complex attitude. Come blah 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 blah. From this point to this point over here. That's something that the author is telling you. That's something that the author is saying. This is what I believe in. This is my definition of XP. Okay. Right then, I'm gonna. Some sociocultural anthropologists even consider even is a very important keyword. What's the value of even? What does what does even imply? It says emphasis, right? It's an it's an emphasis word. When when the author really says some sociocultural anthropologists even considered XP and EC to be opposite sides of the same coin. What is the author trying to, what, can you relate this to another part in the passage itself? It's an extreme view. Why is the author using the word even? What, why does the author need to use the word even? What is he connecting this to? Adds on to which point? Yes. It's, it's related to intimately connected. That is excellent. So, and that's where you need to understand uh, Anamika, uh, not Anamika, who said it's related to intimately connected. Let me just get that piece over here. Uh, Laura said that. That's perfect, Laura. Yes. So, the reason, and you have to ask yourself, what makes, why is, why is it that the author needs to use the word even? The first line the author says is, EC and its canonical variants are deemed to be intimately connected. So, so hey, they're considered to be intimately connected. But then he says, there is this other group of sociocultural anthropologists that consider that connection to be so strong. So, that's why he uses the word even considered. That, that they're even considered XP and EC to be opposite sides of the same coin. So there's this group of social and cultural anthropologists uh, uh, that considers that connection to be so strong that they consider XP and EC to be the opposite to be opposite sides of the same coin. But then there is another few voices uh, that are, that have cautioned that this need not be the case. So you have this group over here in the first line that the author says that says that hey XP and EC and EC are closely connected. Now, this, some people already say that this connection is, is super strong. So plus plus, where they say opposite sides of the same coin, where others says, hey, that need not be the case. So don't consider that these guys are, are kind of don't agree with it. But both of them agree that XP and EC are closely connected with, with each other. Can you really see how in such a small passage, these keywords allow you to derive insights. I mean, just a simple keyword allows you to link it back to the first sentence. And that's why emphasizing understanding on these keywords, pausing, reading slowly is really important. Okay. So let's, let's analyze this and see what does the author really talk about over here. So, First sentence, EC and its variants are closely connected. XP, according to the author, XP leads to hatred for aliens. Then the author says some experts take an extreme view where they say XP and EC coexist, but some other experts disagree with this. 
Okay. So the author in this passage defines a new term XP. That's his definition, where, which is what starts from here. Then, then he says uh, he says some experts consider they are closely connected to one another, whereas some other experts think that they're so closely connected that they coexist, whereas another group of experts think otherwise. Okay, this is an inference question. And remember this, the correct inference is always from the point of view of the author. It can't be something that on which the author has not given an opinion. That's really important. The other piece is, if the passage presents facts, the author will agree with facts. Okay. With that, let's go back over here and I'm going to bring back how you guys pulled on, on this one. Let's bring the poll back. Oh, what's going on? Here is how you guys polled over here. Choice A was very popular. Choice A is wrong. Okay, you can see how you guys polled in this one. Over here. Uh, I'm going to share the passage with you guys so you guys can, can read the passage in the notes pane. Here is the passage and, and you guys can read it in, in the notes pane over here. So I'm going to reduce this so you have this over here. Choice A is wrong. Why? Because you know the author doesn't say that XP and EC are different facets. This is a view of some experts, not authors. We don't really know if it's author's view or, or, or whether it's not. The author may agree with it. The author may not agree with it. We don't know of, of either one. A number of you chose this particular answer. Are you now clear why this is not my correct answer? Let me bring in the poll over here. Let me just clear the prior response. Okay, perfect. And Shruti, thank you for that feedback. I'll make sure that I have the paragraph with you. Choice B says the canonical variants of EC are closely connected with XP. Again, this is a considered view as the same reason as choice A. It doesn't really mean that the author agrees with it. So this is why this is wrong. For those of you who chose choice B, is that clear? We don't know whether the author agrees with, with this or not. Okay, So remember, an inference is always from the point of view of author. For those of you who are saying no, can you please put your answers, uh, put your questions in in the Q&A part? The question that you have to ask yourself is, does the author tell you that, that they are closely uh, connected with XP. The author says EC and its canonical variants are deemed to be intimately connected with XP. Deemed means considered to be. Remember, it's the same example. The colored blue is considered to be soothing. Does it mean that the author considers it to be soothing? No, it doesn't mean that. It means some people consider it to be, smooth, to, to, to be soothing. In the same way where I had put in, the, put in this example, I'm going to put put in this the same, same piece over here. Go, when I say, tell you Google is considered a good buy and if you buy Google, can you blame me? Are you going to blame me uh, if it doesn't pan out? If I tell you Google is considered a good buy and, and if it doesn't pan out, can you blame me? No, you cannot. You're just merely passing information. On the other hand, if I tell you Google is a, is a good buy and it doesn't pan out, then you can blame me. Okay, and that's the difference. Nguyen says, so, so, so B is reality, not the author's view. No, we don't know whether B is reality. We know that a few people consider these to be intimately connected. Okay, we don't know if it's reality. We what we know is that a few people believe that to be the case. We definitely don't know whether the author believes it to be the case. The author is merely passing information. In the same way, in the same way, 
uh, uh, in the prior example, when I'm telling you Google is considered to be a good buy, we don't know whether I consider Google to be a good buy or whether I don't consider Google to be a good buy, right? We don't know what's my view on it. So you can't draw inferences based on my view. Yes, Laura. So when the question asks what can be inferred, it means what the author would, 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 would believe in this. Okay. Now, which is why choice C is wrong. Choice C says X, P, and E, C are not connected with, with, with each other. We don't know that either. You know, we don't know what is the author's view. So, so we can't really say one way or the other. Okay. In some cases, X, P is the cause of E, C. We don't know about any cause-effect relationship. That's something which is not mentioned over there. Okay. Again, choices C and D, for those of you who chose choices C and D, I want to make sure. C and D, are you guys clear? We can't say whether XP is connected. We can't say whether XP is not connected. Why? Because the author hasn't given his opinion on it. The author is merely presenting information. Which brings us to, the, to our correct answer, which is XP entails dislike towards strange. And why can we say this is correct inference? Why? Because the author tells us that this part is something that the author believes. This is the author's information. A complex attitude comes sentiment structure involving blah, 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 blah. This is exactly where this comes from. And so choice E is my correct answer. And the biggest, you know, about 27% of you did choose choice E. All right. The, that is a really good question. If the, if the author clearly tells us how is that an inference, first of all, which is essentially what Dar, what you're really saying is, how can uh, uh, the inference be rewording of a statement that's already stated? How many of you have the same question? How can it be very similar rewording of the statement? How many of you have that question? Okay. Let me first give you another example. Okay. So I think I'm going to talk about two points and I'm going to uh, really bring this one over here. So on the GMAT, the defin first of all, what definition of inference is, what does the author consider to be true uh, 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 with 100% surety? Or in other words, the, the, what, what I like to really tell people is to really say, if you were betting your money on something, what would you bet your money on? That's the definition of an inference. Really. So if you were betting your money on, hey, this is something that the author definitely believes in, what would you bet your money on? That is, is my definition of, uh, of, of inference. Okay. That's something which is, which is, which is uh, really important over here. Just one second, guys. Just give me one second. I just want to disable notifications that way they don't bother me. Okay. Yes. Can, yeah. Inference questions can also be told as must be true. What does the author, author can consider as a must be true piece over there? All right. Uh, I think, which means that if you know, if I tell you, If I give you this statement, then and 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 okay. Uh, 
Is this not an inference? Rahul is likely to excel on GMAT CR. Yes, I mean, it's, it's very obvious, but it is an inference. It's information that you're deriving from it. Similarly, any piece of information that you can say is 100% certain given this information in the passage, and if it's there in the answer choices, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is an inference. In fact, a lot of people think if something's stated super explicitly and if it comes in the answer choices, that can't be the correct inference. And because they hear it from some experts. And I can tell you uh, that I have research. In fact, as a company, we are 50 people who work full time, probably the only company in the world where we have 50 people who work full time and helping you excel on, on the GMAT. We haven't found a single instance where you see a restatement and it's considered wrong. Because the definition of inference is, given the information in the passage, what can we say with 100% certainty that the author would agree with? If the author agrees with it, uh, with 100% and you can say that with 100% certainty, then you can infer that. Okay. Inference is the same as conclusion. Inference is the same as must be true for all practical purposes. Okay. Okay. With that, um, I hope you guys are, are learning something because we now want to get to a full length passage. Also, some of you have been asking about uh, uh, the link to how, how can you build a study plan? How can you figure out how much time you should need to, to, to ace the GMAT? Uh, so so here, is, here is the link to the study plan. I'm going to keep that at the bottom over here. Now with that, I'm going to give you a full length passage. We're now going to answer, uh, we're going to, going to solve a full length passage over here. Um, uh, I want to make sure that each one of you has a pen and paper ready and each one of you has, has a glass of water with you. So select yes if you have a pen and paper ready, select yes if you have a glass of water that's there with you. So that I can then show the full length passage. All right, about 93% of you do that going to hide this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show the passage in, in, in a notes pane. Uh, here is the passage in a notes pane. Over here, um, I'm going to move this part. We're going to organize this over here. What's better? Is, is the notes pane better? And I'm going to put in a short answer part over here and I'm going to show the passage over here as well. Which view is better? Is the notes view better or, or is, 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 is the PowerPoint view better? Notes is much better, right? Okay. We're going to keep the notes view over here so you guys have it. And I'm going to minimize the PowerPoint view uh, so that you guys get more real estate. You guys get four minutes to read this passage.
Okay, guys, select yes as you're done reading the passage. If you're still reading, select no. I'm going to give you another 15 seconds before I start showing questions over there. Uh, I think it's almost been about four minutes. So I'm going to hide this poll. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to move this part over here so that you guys can still read this. And we're going to have the poll questions at the bottom uh, over here, actually. Let's just move this, in this case, that way you guys still have the passage. And let's make the poll question slightly longer. And over here. Now, um, I'm going to give you about a minute and a half to answer each question. I'm going to start showing questions over here. So you have the passage on the right, so you still have access to the passage, and then you have the poll question below the passage. So, good luck, guys. All right, last 15 seconds, guys, get those answers in. Three, two, and one. And thank you for the phenomenal response. Let me end the poll and broadcast the results over here. I can see how you guys polled. I'm going to hide this one. I'm going to bring in my second question over here. Uh, not broadcast results. Place it properly. And over here, here is the second question. Okay. Uh, good luck, guys.
All right, last 15 seconds, get those answers in. Three, two, and one. Let me end the poll. Let me record your accuracy over here. Let me broadcast results. You can see how you guys did. Choices A and D were very popular. Let me bring in the third question over here. Here is the third question. I'm going to remove broadcast results, reopen the poll, and here is your third question. Good luck, guys. Okay, guys, another 15 seconds, get those answers in. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let me record that accuracy. Again, I need a few more people to put in their, their responses, guys. Let me end the poll. I'm gonna broadcast the results. Here's you guys, how you guys did. A, C, D, and E were quite popular. Let me select the poll for our fourth question. Here's the poll for our fourth question. Here is the fourth question. Uh, good luck, guys. Okay, get those answers in. Three, or the five, four, three, two, 
and uh, and 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 one uh, looking at how you guys respond is it's it's like it's very interesting there's, there's this group of people who get done in about a, but uh, uh, about 55 seconds or so and about 75 percent of you get done in about 55 seconds and then I don't see any responses coming for for another 15 seconds which is when I start to call time and then as soon as I call time there are these bunch of you who just wait till the last moment today say let me wait till then and then select a poll then I get the the, the, the remaining 15 percent or so who come in over there so let me end the poll broadcast the results this is how you guys polled let me select the poll. Here is the last question for the day. Let me reopen the poll. And here is the poll question for you. Okay, let's get those answers in another 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. And this is a difficult question. That's why I gave you about 15 to 20 more seconds over here. Let me end the poll. I'm gonna broadcast the results. Uh, let me record the accuracy on at my end. And what you see is, is we have a split jury between choices A and C. Both of them are very popular. And choices B and D are also quite popular. Choice E isn't. Um, let me hide this poll over here. Let me hide the passage as well. And ask you. So and expand this presentation so we, we have a slightly better view of the presentation. So how do we guys feel? How, how, how did this, I mean, this is a 700 level passage right there for you. How did that feel? It felt nice, yes. You guys did really well. Uh, I would say, I mean, on an average, you know, um, you, uh, I would say about... Uh, the average accuracy for this group is we answer about three out of five questions correctly. There is about 35% of you who answered four out of five questions correctly um, or so. So so that's, that's really, really good to know over here. So that is good. Um, how would you rate it difficult or moderate? That's a, a question which, which stats. It's all numbers. It's not my rating. It's it's the stats uh, uh, that are provided by the GMAC uh, in the passages in, in, in OG as well as uh, every passage in the OG advanced is, is a difficult passage. Every passage um, uh, in, in, in OG, which is towards the last 30% of the passages, is a difficult passage too. So, um, so yeah. With that, let's just get into right over here. We already talked about how you guys did. So let's look at how uh, we, we go about doing this. So here's the first first paragraph. The first paragraph say um, says that uh, F and M assert, so 
Frazier and Mott Seller. Again, I don't care about their names. I, I want to make sure that I, I, I'm able to read it properly, so I'll call them FNM. FNM assert that medical research could be improved by, by a move towards the larger, simpler clinical trials of medical treatments. Okay, um, so we really say per FNM, medical research can be improved if you go towards this over here. Currently, um, now, here's a very important word over here uh, before we go there. When you say, when you read this FNM assert, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? FNM assert. What have we learned so far? It's not the author's opinion, it's someone else's. The author is merely presenting information. It's according to FNM. Yes, that's very good. You are coming along with me. I like that. Okay. Currently, currently means the state of affairs today. It's a really important keyword, which means, you know, if you're talking about what happens currently, uh, currently researchers collect far more background information on patients than is strictly required. Okay. So, what, who has written this line Cur from currently till this point? Who is, that's author's view, right? You guys are good. You guys are getting there. Okay. Substantially more than hospitals correct. Why does the author mention this part? What is the purpose of this? Substantially more than authors, authors collect. It's the emphasis. It's the comparison. Comparison on GMAT RC. Uh, the, these comparisons are really important. I can build a question. What's the purpose of this line? Substantially more than authors, uh, than hospitals collect. It's just showing a comparison as to how much more information do researchers col uh, uh, collect on patients. And, 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 and it just presents a data point for you or, or a comparison point. Collect. Thereby, another really important keyword, thereby is a conclusion, an outcome keyword, thereby escalating costs of data collection, storage, and analysis. Okay. So because they collect so much information, it, it in, increases the, the cost over there. Okay. Then you have another keyword over here, although. Although limiting information collection could increase the risk that researchers will overlook facts relevant to study, FNM contend that such risk, again, the author is presenting FNM's opinion again over here, um, such as never entirely eliminable from research would still be small in most cases. Let's go from this to this. What, what, what line of reasoning is this? Where, where I talk about this? What is this line of reasoning that we talk about? It's very popular in critical reasoning. It is what we call as a defense against weakness. When the author, and that's where the word although becomes also very important. I say although author, it's, it's, it's defense against a counter argument, not a counter argument, it's defense against it. So more oftentimes when we present a change, you know, we, we, we kind of preempt that resistance to change. And, and, and we, we, we present uh, um, a defense against that preemption, okay? So, so, so this is a defense against weakness, a potential weakness. This is not a counter premise. This is a defense against that, okay? The counter premise is that uh, will overlook facts. That part is counter premise where this entire line is a defense against it. Or in other words, if this were a CR passage, and if I, if I asked you what's the role played by this statement, um, uh, you would say this is a defense against a potential weakness. And but, however, although they are very, very similar, they are contrast keywords, yes. All right, so let's look at this over here. Although limiting information could increase the risk that researchers will, will overlook facts relevant to the study. So the author really says, hey, if you look at fewer variables, if, if you collect less data, then, then there's a possibility that, that, that you overlook facts. FNM contend that such risk never entirely eliminable, which means that even when you collect all of this data, there is still some risk. It will be small in, in most cases. I say that risk would be very, very small in most cases. Only, only is another really important keyword in research on entirely new treatments are new and unexpected variables likely to arise. What they're saying is the only place the, that, that where this collecting this much information is valuable uh, could be could provide new insights for where you're talking about entirely new treatments over here. Okay. Um, Hannah has a great question. Is the first half of author sentence opinion reality? 
Ah, that's a great question. And is it is, is author's opinion or reality? Although limiting such information could risk, that's by the author. The author is really saying is you might think that that this could really say F and M content. Okay, so think about it. If I were to really draw, take it to a parallel scenario, and Hannah, that's a great question. Um, if you were to present some piece of information, and you would really say, although, so you say, uh, Google has been spending a lot in R and D, and then you say, although that that high expense in R and D could indicate that they would run out of cash. Right, so which is you saying? I'm although you might as a, as a reader, you might really think that they could run out of cash. Google asserts that they have enough reserves. So, so again, the author is saying is that hey, you might think this, and but there is this other piece of information, related piece of information that Google is telling me that I'm also presenting to you in that context. Okay. Okay, and that's really important. Piyush says, only in research is that author's opinion. This one, the way it's stated, is is, is author's opinion over here. Um, I think from the passage, it should have been FNM's opinion, but that's one of those things, even in official passages, uh, they, they, they sometimes slip on this. The good thing is they haven't asked a question on, on this part over here. Uh, but but really, the way it's written from a structural standpoint, from a pure structural standpoint, that is author's opinion over there. And that's a great question, Piyush, again. I, I like how you're questioning everything. And and let me ask this. Prior to joining the session, were you questioning things like this to really say, who is saying this? What can we take it on its face value? Whereas what is what can we consider as what author, what someone else is really saying? And and I really love that. And this is this is really good over here now we've done this you guys understand this passage really well i want to just emphasize on something over here which is all the keywords that are here and uh, 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 then, 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 then so that you guys can really see even in this small pa a paragraph how many keywords are there assert is a keyword currently is a keyword okay um Substantially more is a comparison word. I won't call it a classical keyword that I would look at, but I would emphasize on this. Okay. Although is a keyword over here in this case. Uh, content is a keyword over here in this case. Okay. Where is thereby? I thought there was thereby as well. Yes, thereby is a keyword over here. And then only is a keyword over here. You can really see in just this small paragraph, you have about seven keywords that you should focus on um, in this case. All right. I, I love how you guys, I, I, before I finished myself, uh, you, I saw people talking about thereby, people talking about only. That is, is really great. So, so again, I, I love this as to how you guys are, 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 are doing this. But again, even just in this small paragraph, you can see there are these keywords over here. So essentially, as a passage summary, what we see is per FNM, medical research can move towards larger, simpler trials. Currently, what happens, and then he talks about a negative of losing, of, of collecting this much data over there, uh, and and what uh, and then the author provide or, or FNM provided defense against weakness. Uh, would you? Let me just see who put this question. It's a question, but but uh, don't put that in the short answer poll. So would you recommend going back and forth between the passage and the question? I don't recommend that. I recommend reading the passage in a single go. And then probably if I'm solving five questions against a passage, I would go back to the passage twice across those five questions. That's what I would do. Would you agree to make notes like the one in passage analysis? Uh, when you're starting off, absolutely. But what's going to happen, and this is a question that a lot of people ask, if you're starting off, if you, you are at what I call as a 30th or a 40th percentile, and which is where uh, when you work with one of our experts, we tell you where you are, we have specific tests around this, you will take notes early on, and that will help you get more questions right. But as you start taking those notes, you would start seeing these keywords automatically, these past pa segment summaries, paragraph summaries will automatically start to form, and that need to take notes is going to do, go down a lot. 
and and that's what's going to happen but if you feel the need if you feel overwhelmed definitely take notes and and that's where i think the key thing really is your brain will know when you're comprehending and your brain will tell you when you need to take notes okay let's go forward over here let's go to the next one so essentially at a very high level what we did was the the author presents the benefits of a simpler trial as a proposal by fnm all right then let's go to our second passage over here okay fnm proposed not only not only is is, is a keyword there's a proposal there's a, another keyword over here not only that researchers limit their data collection on individual patients but also which not only all is always followed with but also which means there are two things over there um, but that's a related list but also that researchers enroll patients in, in, in uh, uh, enroll a large number of patients in clinical trials thereby obtaining a more representative sample of the total population under study thereby as another keyword it's an outcome keyword over there so there's a second proposal that's put in there where it's saying it's not only collect less data so i'm linking the prior paragraph over here but also increase the size of the trial and by doing that an outcome of that is you get a much more representative sample often another keyword a lot of people don't think about it as a keyword but it's a keyword which says what's the general practice often researchers restrict study participation to patients who have no ailments besides those being studied a treatment that's successful under these ideal conditions can then then means a sequence of things be evaluated under normal conditions so the author really talks about what's the current practice over here this is something that the author really says currently study uh, we we study includes patients that that are what we call as ideal patients they only have that one disease um, and then it's a two step process where if if the treatments are successful for those guys uh then it can be evaluated under normal conditions overall okay so the author is now going towards uh, fnm's proposal of benefits of a larger trial okay then the author carries on he says broadening the range of trial participants again how look at how the the author is 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 strategically positioning this part fnm suggest would enable researchers to evaluate evaluate means look at the pros and cons um of a treatment's efficacy for a div- for diverse patients under various conditions and to evaluate its effectiveness for different subgroups so there what the author is saying is there'll be two benefits over here again um uh, efficacy uh, and effectiveness do we need to know this no we don't need to know this but what we need to really worry about is that there are two benefits one is that efficacy the second is the effectiveness of different patient subgroups and then the author really says for example this is to emphasize the point the value of a treatment for a progressive so the author is explaining this through this may vary according to the patient stage of disease patient's ages may also um, affect uh, a, a treatment's efficacy so he gives two examples as to the benefits of that okay so the proposal in addition to increasing the size of uh, uh, to, to collect less data it's also to increase the si- size of trial and the author uh, 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 really talks about uh, uh, the benefits that that would be there and they're talking about two benefits or two examples that are mapped to these two benefits um the other inference that you can draw from this is that as per fnm when you do this 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 uh, this this a uh, uh, broader trial you won't need to do the two step trial as is done currently okay um again at a very high level from a passage summary the first passage paragraph talks about simpler trial and and and, and the author really says hey uh, according to fnm it will not increase the risk but will is likely to reduce the cost and the author also explains the current scenario this is explained by the author the second proposal by fnm is to move towards a larger trial and the benefits are that you obtain a much more representative sample of of total population and you know, the insights that you gain would, um, would 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 give results that are much more representative okay okay so with that let's get to our questions here let me just change this and i want to make sure that i put in your put in the, the poll questions on a, at a point on the screen over here um here's my past question one this is how you guys polled 
Really great question. Uh, is there a specific indicator to 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 identify as switch between author's view and 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 um, and subject's view? There there isn't a single. That's a great question, Roger. That's, there isn't a single specific indicator. But but someone contends, someone asserts according to X, Y, and Z. This means that someone else's view. But if the author really says um, X is this. X is Y, rather than using X is considered to be this, the author says X is this, or this is defined as, um, or, uh, then that's something which is which is author's view or author's presenting facts, which the author considers to be true. Okay. Um, so, what's the main point of the passage? Let's kind of do a pre-thinking. Um, so, the first that we think is in the initial part, the author presents a, a proposals to present to improve medical research. Then, uh, by F and M, two kinds of ways in which to improve medical research are, are discussed. One is simpler; the second is larger. So, essentially, what the author is doing in this is it's he's presenting a two-prong proposal to improve medical research. Okay. Choice D is the correct answer. Sixty-one percent of you got choice D. So, we, and choices C and E were quite popular. So, that's what we're going to focus on. A and B uh, are, are not correct. Very few of you chose this. Choice A says identify two practices that may affect the accuracy. We don't talk about the accuracy of trial. Um, describing aspects of medical research that tend to drive up costs. Uh, the, it's a partial scope over here. Well, the first paragraph talks about it, not the second paragraph. Choice C talks about evaluating an, uh, an analysis of certain shortcomings of, of um, of, of current medical practices. Um, so evaluating an analysis means, so this is a very loaded answer choice and I understand why choice C will confuse you. This is what we call as a, a bold face kind of answer choice, which is a three dimensional answer choice. What does it say? Let's start with this part over here. Certain shortcomings of current medical prop, uh, of, 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 of practice, so current medical practices. So uh, the this choice says it, it is an analysis of current uh, of shortcomings of these medical practices. So, do we are we really doing an analysis of certain shortcomings? Well, not really. Are we doing the pros and cons of that analysis? Not really. We are not evaluating the pros and cons, or we're not doing the pros and cons of an analysis of certain shortcomings over here of current medical practices. The purpose of this is to propose an improvement to it. Okay, and when you ask yourself, so for those of you who wrote cho who chose choice C, I think I want you to ask yourself. The, is the reason why the author wrote this passage, is it to really evaluate some sort of an analysis that was done on shortcomings? And when you really, is that why the author wrote this passage? Yes, no? No, that's not why the author wrote this passage over here. And, and that's where, when I talked about that skill to visualize this, it's not only limited to the passage, but it's also relevant to, to the answer choices. What if the choice were evaluating certain shortcomings? Does the author talk about pros of those shortcomings? Does the author talk about any pros? Right? I mean, the question is, why did the author write this passage? It is to really describe that, uh, that the, the, the proposal that is there, right? The purpose, the reason why I'm doing that is not to really say, hey, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, but it is to really say, here is a proposal, let me describe this proposal to you. Uh, Rokio says, would you say that the main point needs to be disclosed in both paragraphs? Yes, it has to be. It's, it's a main point of the passage. It's not, it can't be limited to a single paragraph. And Rokio, when you go through the main point files, you're going to see about 20 examples of, uh, of, of such. Choice D, which is our correct answer, is describing proposed changes to ways in which clinical trials are 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 are, are conducted. So let's kind of evaluate this, or let's kind of um, uh, zoom in on this. So there are are there proposed changes that are mentioned? Yes. Uh, proposed changes to what? To to ways in which clinical trials are conducted? Yes. And and does the author describe what those changes are? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so so um, Tarang has a really uh, a great point. He says, wouldn't the word proposed changes signify that the universal community proposes? No, 
uh, it doesn't really signify. Even, uh, and, and Tarang, again, if you were to draw a parallel, that's a great question, Tarang, over there. So, um, so, so if I were to really uh, 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 look at a, a researcher who, who, who really talks about um, that's the ways in which COVID spreads, uh, and, 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 and then in that case, uh, and if that were what this passage were, wouldn't you really say this passage describes ways in which COVID spreads? Only, even though only that researcher has done that, but the, the purpose of the passage from an author's standpoint was, would be to describe ways in which COVID spread. Tarang. If one researcher wrote a paper which says this is how there are three ways in which COVID spreads, and then you say, okay, what is the author doing in this paper? Then you'd say the author is describing ways in which COVID spread. It's not, the choice is not saying describing all the proposed changes or all the ways in which COVID spreads, but the purpose is, the reason why the author wrote this passage is to describe ways. Okay. Okay. Piyush says, IMO, the passage is evaluating current research methodology versus the, the, the proposed way. So, does the author, Piyush, does the author talk about any benefits of the current research methodology? No, it doesn't. If the author were to evaluate, and that's again a great question, uh, he would really say, here is the current research methodology, here is the proposed methodology, here are the benefits of current research methodology, here are the benefits of the proposed methodology. That is what evaluating would have been. Okay. So the author isn't doing that. If the author did do that, then we would have used the word evaluating. And again, that's where understanding that keyword is really important. That's the difference between someone who scores a 90th percentile versus someone who scores a 60th percentile in RC. You both spend the same amount of time. And yes, um, And again, remember, this is an official question. All right. Choice E says, explaining how medical researchers have traditionally conducted clinical trials and how such trials are likely to change. We don't know that that how those such trials are likely to change um, overall. So you would really do that and you'd reject that choice on that. Okay. With that, so... What are some of the takeaways? The 40% of you who got this wrong, what did you learn from this? The 40% of you who didn't get this right, what did you learn from this? Okay, see the whole passage. Okay, trust your gut. Okay, that's true. Read all the answers. While you do that, let me get to the, the, the second poll over here. Question two. Negate the answers. Look for the right keywords. Good. Again, you can really see how each and every question over here, uh, 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 in, 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 in this case, is, is designed to... to, to <laughs> to evaluate whether you have understood the passage. It's designed to make sure that you understand the answer choices over there. Give time to answer choice analysis. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. With that, let's go to our second question over here. Which of the following can be inferred from the passage about a study of category of patients referred to in the lines? Um, often study these researchers restrict participation to patients who have no ailments. So what the author is really saying is, what can be inferred about that study in which, you know, you get these ideal set of patients where, where they have only that single ailment over there. What can be inferred about that study? Here is a pa passage over here. What the author really says is, often researchers restrict a treatment just successful under these conditions can then be, then means it's a second step. Remember the keyword, we evaluated under ideal conditions. So which means it, 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 it's, it, its findings really need to be validated, all right? Or the results of that finding are very, um, very limited or those, these studies only cover ideal conditions. Any of these uh, would be correct. Choice A is our correct answer. 
its findings may have limited applicability. Why? Because they then have to be evaluated again, which means, you know, they're not, they don't have broad applicability. Specifically also, when you see stuff that happens uh, uh, as per the proposal when FNM talk about enrolling a wide variety of participants over here. Choice B talks about expense. We don't care about expense over here. Choice C says it would be the best way to sample the total population. Actually, it's just the opposite as per the as per FNM. So, so FNM according to according to FNM, there's a better way, and they're talking about an improvement. Um, choice D. Those of you who choose D, mix what was mentioned in paragraph one with what's there in paragraph two. It's choice D says it would allow researchers to limit information collection without increasing the risk that important variables could be overlooked that's mentioned in paragraph a it's not it's not mentioned in the context of 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 enrolling you know patients with that one singular ailment or enrolling a wide variety of patients okay uh, choice a is correct is the icon wrong choice a is correct this one is correct okay so uh, okay. um Choice E says its finding would be more accurate if it compares if it concerns treatment for progressive disease and if it concerns treatment for a non-progressive disease. Again, the, uh, for those of you who chose choice E, you did not understand the intent uh, of, of this. You did not understand the intent of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of presenting the progressive versus non-progressive. The intent is, is not to really compare the findings over there. The intent of progressive disease uh, uh, were, were to really say that, hey, when you, uh, when you really enroll a wide variety of participants, uh, you would really get these additional insights about progressive diseases. Can I really say uh, uh, how C is opposite? So what does choice C say? It would be the best way to sample the total pop population of potential patients. What happens when we enroll an ideal set of patients? Are we sampling all the potential patients or are, only, are we only sampling a very limited set and then we have to expand this? Let's focus on this term potential patients. If we are sampling a limited set, so are we sampling a total population of potential patients as per the passage? No, we are not sampling the total population. Okay, is that the best way to do the sampling as per the passage? No, it isn't. So those of you who were confused with choice C, does that help you understand why choice C is wrong? Yes, okay, perfect. Not really, why not? The answer is choice A, choice A. And I'm sorry about this, 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 this part over here, guys. I'm sorry about the fact that choice D, the, the annotation says choice D is correct, um, but, but choice A is the correct answer. It was the, it's the annotation, uh, it's the PowerPoint that, that messed up over here. Choice A, A for alpha, 55% of you got it right. Does that clear that piece? And Harsha, if you can make a note. We just updated this presentation. Okay. The PowerPoint likes D, okay. That's a good one. Um, that is, uh, that's very good. Yes, PowerPoint likes D. Well, it's not. I have this saying, you know, it's it's humans who make mistakes. Machines don't make mistakes. So it's our mistake, not a machine. I, I can't fault the tool. So, um, so yeah, let's move on. Let's go to this part. Let's go to question number three over here. This is how you guys pulled. Let's look at question three. 60% um, of you got it right, which is really impressive, by the way. Question three says, it can be inferred that a study limited to patients uh, like those mentioned in often researchers restrict parties who have no ailments besides those being certain would have which of the following advantages. So what would the benefit of this? What can you infer from the passage as the benefit of, uh, of, of this study over, over a study that, that is proposed by FNM? 
all right or in other words what it's saying is what's the advantage of current way of doing things so what are we doing in this we are restricting participations to patients who have no other ailments what are fnm saying it says hey enroll patients with all sorts of ailments not just this particular ailments so essentially the advantage of this is if you just study those you don't have to worry about other ailments which means you'd, you'd have less data to analyze over there okay that's something uh, uh, which is there let's look at choices a and b choice a says it will yield more data and its findings will be more accurate that's not talked about in this in the context of this study where you're limiting this if you chose choice a you probably did not read this part that the the, the limited study what advantage would that have over over the proposed study am i correct for those of you who chose choice a you guys did not read the question properly its findings will have uh, would yield more data and its finding would be more accurate if you chose this am i correct for people who chose choice a you didn't understand what the question was asking okay let's look at choice c over here which is the correct answer choice c says it would limit the number of variables researchers would need to consider while evaluating the treatment that is correct why because you're only enrolling that um, it would help researchers identify subgroups that's an advantage of the proposed study not this study again you didn't read the question properly it would enable researchers to assess the value of an experimental treatment for an average patient don't talk about experimental treatment don't talk about average patients over there so uh, limited how would limiting variables be an advantage it's 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 one of the benefits right if you have to analyze less data it's an advantage over the proposed study you're comparing that okay now very quickly 60 percent of you got it right what did you learn from this it'll make it easier to do the research yes what did you learn from this the 40 percent who got it wrong the one big learning that you should have is the one big learning that you should have is read the question correctly read the question correctly really important slow down while reading the question sanjeev says what's a good accuracy for 700 level rc questions four out of four or five questions 65 to 70 percent is good accuracy over here why not e does the passage talk about experimental treatment does the passage talk about experimental treatment no do you guys know what an experimental treatment is does the passage talk about an average patient does the pass do you know what an average patient is um, <laughs> please don't take bleach for covid uh, an average pa the passage talks about different subgroups it doesn't talk about experimental patients okay and for those of you who says an inference goes beyond what is mentioned actually no the inf an inference in which is what we discussed this Saurabh an inference is something that is 100 percent certain based on the information given in a passage or or, a, or an argument okay it has to be 100 percent certain and again if, if that's how you what you're thinking is then you're going to have lots of problems in CR because CR will kill you RC doesn't kill you as much where does the passage mention uh, number of variables it doesn't mention but if you're limiting study to to patients who only have that ailment and if you're comparing that to a study to patients who have all sorts of other ailments in addition to that of course you're going to have uh, fewer patients fewer fewer variables right that is something that you can be 100 percent certain about the question is about the advantage yes all right so the next question it's a purpose question let's kind of get you guys did pretty well on this one too passage question four it's a purpose question uh, but 70 percent of you got it right so we're going to go through this very quickly the the question says what's the purpose what the author mentions this part primarily in order to which means what's the purpose of him mentioning this 
purpose. Forget about my scribbling, it's bad. Um, why does the author mention these patients? He really is just to really put an example of the benefits in you of, of, of a broader array of, of enrolling a broader array of patients. Let's look at this over here. Let's focus on choices. Choice C, indicate why a progressive disease may require different treatments at different stages. No, he doesn't indicate why. It doesn't re indicate the reason part over here. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and then that's a different example as well. But even for that, if this were the same example, it doesn't indicate the reason for that. Let's look at choice D, illustrate a point, make it a point about enrolling a wide a range of patients in the clinical trials. That is correct. Choice E, very few people chose that. Let's look at choice A. Identify the most critical variable uh, or differentiating subgroups of patients. How can you infer that it's the most critical variable? Right? There's no mention of that. You can't be 100% that age is that most critical variable over there. Okay. C is wrong because it doesn't indicate why progressive diseases will require. Do you know why progressive diseases will require different treatments at different uh, different stages? Once you read the passage, do you do you understand? Can you answer that question? Why progressive diseases would require different treatments? Is your are your nerves not working? Are your lungs not functioning as well? Does the passage answer any of that? No, it doesn't. The reasoning of that is not there. Again, when you look at this, visualize that answer. That's very important. When you say indicate why progressive diseases, your brain will tell you, mark this, mark this, mark this. But you've got to visualize it to really say, what does this choice actually mean? Does this choice tell me, does the passage tell me that here is a reason why progressive diseases require different uh, treatments at different stages? No, it doesn't tell me that. It just tells me that it may require and the efficacy of a treatment against a progressive disease. But that causality, the reasoning is not there. List says, why is E not the answer? Substantiate an argument about problems inherent. The, auth that the purpose of this is to really talk about the benefits, not the problems. And which is why E is not the answer, Liz. Let's look at choice passage 5, or or, or other. Question five, this is where you guys uh, kind of stumbled. Choice A, A for alpha, A for apple is the correct answer. Choice A, is, and, and, and I understand the confusion between choices A and C, so I'm going to really talk about that over there. Also focus on, on choices B and D. Choice, um, question five says, according to the passage, which of the following describes a result of the way in which researchers generally conduct clinical trial, which result means outcome. And again, one of the things that he really says, even before I go look at the answer choices, I understand the question. I spend that time doing that over here. So, so let's talk about this. And, and again, outcome of what? Let's go. In which the research, in which the way researchers generally conduct trials. We're not talking about FNM. We're talking about researchers generally conduct trials. Okay. So, what is what are the two things that we know about that? The first thing is that. They collect a lot more data as required, which is over here in this page, and that leads to higher costs of data. The second thing is they conduct, they need to conduct this, and uh, they need to conduct two trials. One is ideal condition, and the second is then they have to enroll in the next stage of patient. That's how researchers generally do this. So either one of these could be the correct answer. Is pre-thinking okay? It could either be this or it could be this. Is that okay? Yes, no. Okay, perfect. Let's look at this choice. Choice A, which is our correct answer, say they expend resources on storage of information likely to, to be relevant. They collect information which which is which is not as useful, which um, and and they they spend money on doing that. So yes, they do expend resources on this, um, and which makes this correct. Let's look at. Choice C. A lot of you chose choice C, and I'm going to bring my passage back to to talk about why choice C is not the correct answer. And so, it's a, this one is a, is a is a tricky one. So, um, 
Choice C says they avoid the risk of overlooking variables that might, um, let me make sure I remove this part. They avoid the risk of overlooking variables that might affect their findings even though doing so raises the research cost. Avoid means eliminate. When you avoid a road, you don't take that. Let's just look at what's there. F and M contend that such risk never entirely eliminable. I'm going to highlight that part over here. Never entirely eliminable. Okay. So if it, the risk is never entirely eliminable, do they avoid that risk? The answer is no. Which is why this particular choice is, is, is not correct. For those of you who chose choice C, do you guys know why choice C is wrong? Okay, choice D and E. If the risk is never entirely eliminable, then they can't be avoiding that risk, right? If the risk is never entirely eliminable, then they can't be avoiding the risk over here. Sorry about that, just one second. If that risk is never entirely eliminable, then you can't be avoiding that risk. Okay. Choice D, because they attempt to analyze too much information, they overlook facts that could emerge as relevant to their studies. Where did you get this? For those of you who chose choice D, where do you see this? That they, they, they overlook facts in paragraph one, which is where they are analyzing too much information. Does paragraph one say that by analyzing too much information, they would be overlooking facts? Or does the passage say that they compromise the accuracy of their findings? What does the passage say? Does the passage say they compromise the accuracy by collecting? If they collect more information, they compromise the accuracy. Mod, here is the passage. And which is where I think it's really important to understand what the passage is saying. Let me just bring in the notes part over here. Let's just look at this over here. Does, the, does it say, it, they might, who's saying that? Let's just look at this. Abhinav said that they might overlook important info. It might have, do they overlook important information because they collect more information, Abhinav? The answer choice is, you have got to read the entire answer choice. The answer choice says, they sometimes compromise the accuracy by collecting. By collecting more information, is that the reason why they're overlooking that? No, they're not doing that. Okay. And that's where understanding those keywords, uh, that's really important. Okay. Not clear on C. Let's look at this. Saurabh, let's look at what you're really saying. Let's let everyone read Saurabh's point. Uh, not absolutely clear on C, uh, inferring it from the second passage, they only selectively choose patients. Aren't they overlooking potential factors like age? Are they raising the research cost in, in paragraph two? By the way, number two, are they overlooking those? In paragraph two, it's mentioned that it's a two-step process. Does paragraph two mention that the that the results of this study are are more accurate? In paragraph two, in the current way, right? What they say: treatment just successful under these conditions can then be evaluated under normal conditions. That's a two-step process. The, has the author said anywhere, sort of, that this process leads to worse results? Has it? No. And, and that's really important for you to draw. What the author is talking about with regards to broadening the range is efficiency.
Okay, let's look at this part over here. Yaya says, is it, it isn't stated some information stored is irrelevant. It is stated. Currently, researchers collect far more backgrounds than is strictly required. What does this mean? Megha or Yaya. If it's strictly required for trials, then okay again really important to understand where you're faltering and which is why you need to such detailed solutions okay so can you really see and we're going to move forward now because we are over our time for 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 the session i want to talk about what's next steps for you guys uh, and, and and but first things what have you learned from this what have you learned from solving the seven questions that we have solved overall so far. Pay attention to keywords, read, summarize information, really, really important. Okay. Inference belongs to the author. Read the questions carefully. Do not overthink, really, really important. The other piece is reject read the options very carefully as well that's very important too okay read the options very 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 carefully okay now make sure you 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 read the passage properly notice the linkages and draw inferences all right um, we talked about this over there to get to that 730 or higher score, we want to now talk about how do you get to that 90th percentile ability. The first thing, and I see a question there, how do you increase my reading speed? Don't worry about increasing the reading speed. And I, I, I will tell you this, you shouldn't. The moment you worry about increasing the reading speed is the moment you falter on, on, on RC, SC, and CR. By the way, does this, uh, does this advice seem surprising to you? You know, GMAT expert telling you that don't increase your reading speed. Yes. By the way, and, and, and definitely, but when you go and see, we account for more verbal reviews than all the other test prep companies combined on GMAT Club do. And there's a reason for that. Because when you do this, you improve. Second thing is data. So, so here is the thing. You don't increase your reading speed. You work towards reading strategies and your reading speed automatically increases. Let's talk about why should you read slowly in a time test and how does that increase your speed? This is the input. The output is, is increased speed over here. Here are, here is how if you read slowly, you're going to really do. You're going to spend about three minutes reading the passage. Not today, not tomorrow, but in seven to eight days, once you've solved 20 passages, you're going to spend about three minutes reading and comprehending a passage. And as you do that, you would be able to answer each question in about a minute. And you were doing that today. Once you spent five minutes reading the passage, you were able to answer, but 70% of the of the class was able to answer uh, uh, each question in a minute. And I was seeing those numbers come in and you got great accuracy today. Okay. Which means you'd need about seven minutes per passage. This is going to be for most passages. But every now and then you will still see a passage where you need longer. You need about four minutes to read the passage. Now, here is what happens when you get those difficult passages. Your time required to answer a question goes down. The questions in those passages are usually easier over there. Okay. And, 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 and that's something that you have to understand when you, when you get to this. So read slowly as the passages get more difficult. Uh, and, and as the passages get more difficult, you're going to be able to get more of those questions, right? If you understand that passage, you're going to be able to increase your score more. Why? Because most people, when they, when the passages get difficult, rush through them and they make more mistakes. Okay. On the other hand, if you go through speed reading, you know, read a passage in about two minutes, and then you're going to spend close to two minutes per question or a minute for minute and a half. You'll end up taking the same eight minutes over there you'll have a lot more mental friction and your accuracy will be a lot lower. Has anyone experienced this? Speed reading, reading quickly, rushing through and then going, doing that back and forth? 
don't want to do that back and forth. You want to build that ability. All alternatives look the same, as you really say. The thing which you have to really say is, if you comprehend the passage, you'd be able to get to the answer in one minute. Now, some of you may really be saying, how the hell can that happen? Here's what happens when you comprehend the passage. You have a clear idea of what's there in the passage, what's not. You'll have a clear idea of what the author is saying and what someone else is saying. You'd be able to pre-draw inferences. You'll understand the keywords. Also, as you read and, and solve more and more passages, by reading slowly and by analyzing each option, some of these constructs would, would start to become automatic things in your mind. When you see, according to XYZ, this is a uh, 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 XYZ consider, um, uh, imply, and so on and so forth. Uh, what you're going to see is these constructs will start automatically form, uh, you'd start to visualize these constructs automatically, which is where you'd have an automatic increase in speed. Okay. Um, Abhinav says, take care of accuracy and the speed will take care of itself. Is that what you want to say? Yes and no. And I want to say no to this. Why? Because you could take care of accuracy by reading a passage five times. And, 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 and then if you do that, then as your speed is not going to increase. Why? Because you're increasing your comprehension by reading something five times. What I am really saying is use keywords, read slowly, infer, but read the passage just once. Okay, does that make sense? Up enough? Okay, that's a very big difference. No one calls me sir, by the way. Here are some examples of students. Um, uh, uh, someone who's, who's, who studied at Columbia Business School, one of her former students, scored six, 740 on the GMAT. She says, you should read all the text, not only not just the first and last sentence of each paragraph. As long as you take understand the whole paragraph, it takes only 30 to 50 seconds to answer each question. Okay, um, you can actually go watch these interviews. They're all on our YouTube session, uh, YouTube uh, 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 channel overall. You can go watch these. You can really see them say these things over there. You can see how they were saying. He says, hey, for, for each passage, for each article, he, she read it by, by, she read to understand them. She analyzed each part of the information and, and, and attributed, a, attributed a causality to it. And essentially, she read it what we call as an SC hat. If you un, uh, attend one of our SC sessions, or if you un, attend one of our CR sessions, you're going to really look at the amount of scrutiny we do to segments in a sentence, uh, how we draw combination inferences. And you're going to really see what that SC hat is. Okay. There's another student, Nishan, we talked about him, um, who scored from a 680 to a 740. He says, what you realize is that you have enough time to cover all questions. Do not stress about timing at all. He, and he knows this because he took the GMAT five times. In the first four attempts, he stressed about timing. He couldn't improve. He says, take three plus minutes to read the passage. Understand and comprehend the passage uh, uh, overall. And takes four plus minutes to read a long passage. Okay says, while you'd be investing time in this strategy, you'd be able to answer questions in 40 to 60, 45 to 60 seconds flat. Uh, Nishan probably wrote the most influential debrief on GMAT Club. Uh, he also shares his ESR. So you can actually uh, go and, and, and read his, his ESR over here. Actually, each one of these guys has written their debriefs. If you click on this, you can go and 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 uh, and read his debrief okay um here's an example of a guy who scored a 760 his name is rohit singh malan he is an ex is or he's actually a current is officer he took the gmat twice in his first attempt he scored a v27 and, and which is actually less than 50th percentile and he says in case of rc i was forced to read the passage multiple times because he did not understand the passage the first time around this guy had gr had aced the IAS exam, which is a really difficult exam to ace. Despite that, on GMAT RC, he faced that. He says, after he started applying reading strategies, um, he says the need to read passages in both CR and RC re uh, repeatedly, that need 
went down significantly. He got into Kellogg School of Management over here. Okay, so you can you can watch these links and you can really say does this do these strategies apply to to all tests? Yes, all well designed tests they do. Even on, in GRE, the same thing applies over there. In fact, a lot of our students take our 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 our, our course just for for who prepare for GRE just for RC. Okay. So how do you do that? The first thing you've got to do if you want to ace GMAT RC is understand how a sentence is written. Go through a master comprehension course. If you're an EGMAT student, do that. Understand the building blocks of a sentence. Deconstruct a long sentence. This is a part of a master comprehension course, by the way. Um, and you can see we teach you how to do this. We evaluate you on this over here. This is your evaluation, not this the file completion. Then we teach you how to pause while reading a sentence. Just the very basics over here that we applied, we teach you everything over there um, in this. Then go through the, the RC course. We have five files on reading strategies. By the way, if you are an EG Math student, how many of you over here are, are, are EG Math students? Let's just get a yes, no poll over here. If you're an EG Math student or someone who'd be purchasing EG Math course um, uh, over here, if you're an EG Math student, enroll for the RC batch. RC batch will be starting an RC batch in which we have two sessions on reading strategies, two dedicated sessions on reading strategies over there in which we'll teach you how to read. This was just a summary. We'll give you three lines. We'll, we'll create, we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate you on the most excruciating uh, comparisons, modifiers in RC. Not from a sentence correction standpoint, but we'll have comparison and we'll ask you, what can you infer from it? What is being compared? And, and, and so that when you get to those longer passages, you will see that right then and there. And we'll be starting an RC batch very soon. Okay. Then you go to the main point concept. So once you have that right foundation, make sure you go to the main point concept uh, over there. And again, you learn the main point. Again, this is done, done in a dedicated fashion. Then we evaluate you on this over here. Okay, you have a couple of main point concepts there in the free trial. Make sure you, you spend about 20 to 30 minutes on each one of these. The kind of clarity that you would have about what should a main point constitute that you'd get from this, you you'd, you'd probably won't get anywhere else. Okay, um, so in the end, what do successful test takers focus on? Uh, they focus on um, on a few things. One. They focus on making sure they get they they are immersed in the passage and they visualize whatever they read. They use reading strategies as key tools and they utilize accuracy data to figure out where do they need effort. So we collect a lot of data in Scholar Indian platform. If you're facing issues in in, in detailed questions, inference questions, we can really figure out the causality and help you to improve on that. And by the way, they start with the right kind of study plan over there. So. With that, I want to thank you for joining me today. Um, I know some of you have been asking for that study plan link. You guys can uh, get the same thing over here. And I want to thank you guys for joining me today. So I had a question. Uh, is, is, does the computer adaptive nature work within a, pa uh, within a passage uh, as well? Yes. So if you make mistakes over there, you know, on GMAT, on the GMAT, the, the test takers, uh, the test makers have about eight to ten questions for every paragraph. Depending on how you're doing, they can change the questions. There's, there's adaptiveness over there. Um, while I answer your other questions, and at this point I would be happy to, I'd like to get uh, some feedback on the webinar and and and, and as well as your takeaways. Um, so if you can provide that feedback and takeaways over here, that'd be great. Uh, session PDF, yes, you can download the session PDF as well over here. Let me just actually get the, the right PDF over here. Uh, just give me one second. And thank you for, for that feedback. And here is the PDF that you can download. 
So Catherine, you can download the slides. You should be able to do that now. And if you have any questions that we haven't responded to, we'd be happy to do that right now. Yes, Andrew, there is audio that you should be hearing right now. Okay. Are there recorded videos on our YouTube channel? You can see the recorded videos uh, in previous of previous sessions. What about jargons in RC? There are so the the GMAT RC is not a test of vocab. I understand GRE RC does have vocab in it, but on the GMAT, when you see an RC passage, uh, what you would find is that if even if you see a slightly difficult word, you'd be able to um, to infer the same. So 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 um, so yeah. So don't worry about that. Uh, and that's one of the things, actually one of the concepts that we say, how do you, in, in reading strategies, we teach you, how do you infer meaning of difficult words from, 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 uh, from the information, from the context that's out there. All right. Thank you very much, guys. With that, I want to thank you guys for joining me today and uh, good luck for, for, for your future uh, GMAT preparation. I look forward to seeing you on egmat.com. Also, remember that we have our quant workshop tomorrow, so definitely, um, uh, definitely attend that.